Well, good morning. Welcome to the Hills, to everybody who's live at one of our three campuses or those joining online or later on podcast. My name's Taylor. I'm one of the ministers here and excited to finish out our series, Speak Life. We are in uh, week three. And uh, before we get into the message, I do want to say I'm really excited about something starting next week. So our, our, many of you know that our senior teaching minister, Rick Atchley, has been actually on, on a, uh, a long trip to Israel. So he's walked where Jesus walked. And I'm expecting he's going to come back with all kinds of stuff to share in a brand new series called Living Hope that's going to be out of the book of First Peter. So that starts next Sunday. It's going to be, uh, going to be strong. Really excited about that. And as we wrap up this series on the power of our words, uh, I want to begin with a story that honestly, I, I knew I was probably going to need to tell at some point in this series, but admittedly did not want to. And it comes from my early teens, which maybe says all that needs to be said. I don't remember what the fight was about, but I will never forget the fallout. Me and my mom were going at it, arguing about something, and it escalated, and it got louder, and it got heated, and I I don't know what I was trying to get, but at one point, my mom just kind of threw down her ace and said, and said, stop, go up to your room, and I was so mad. I turned away from my mom, I I turned the corner, started to go up the stairs, and as I stomped up the stairs, I, well, I had accumulated a vocabulary in in middle school that I had started learning, and and for, uh, and, and I had, you know, I'm, I'm a preacher's kid, so I know how to play this. You don't say that stuff at home. You don't say that stuff at church. But in that moment, all of a sudden, the floodgates opened, and I just let loose everything I had learned over the last few years under my breath, cursing up the stairs. And I'm smart, I didn't say it loud enough that my mom could hear, but I said it out loud so I knew I could say it. And I said some things at her under my breath. And I stomped up the stairs, turned the corner to go up the next little short flight, cursing under my breath the whole way and looked up and there was my dad at the top of the stairs. (laughs) You already know, seven kinds of dead meat, like it was over. Because I look at his face and I don't have to wonder if he heard. He heard every single word I had just said towards his bride. Sent straight to bed. The next morning was a Saturday morning. And while my brothers slept in, I was brought out of bed at 6 a.m. and brought down to the kitchen table for the sentencing. (laughs) And I remember sitting there talking with my mom and dad. And my dad said, you know, son, ever since you were a little boy, we have said that those are dirty words. And I don't think you know what that means yet. And I'll never forget, he, he walked over and he brought a plate of dirt. And there was a spoon, which was especially concerning. (laughs) Now, I talked with my parents about this story this week, and and my dad uh, dad said, please let people know. Number one, I was an oldest child, and they overreacted. He said there was a way more Christ-like way to make this point. (laughs) So this is not parenting advice. Number two, my dad said, please let them know that we did not make you eat the plate of dirt. And yet, they did have me take a big spoonful of that. And they said, I want you to hold that in your mouth while we finish this conversation. And I remember sitting with that clod of dirt in my mouth, listening to what else they had to say about the effect of my words, and going to the bathroom, spitting all that out, washing out my mouth. And then, one more piece of the sentencing, besides being grounded for I don't know how long, they had an empty notebook for me, and a page with a list of passages all throughout the Bible. All of those passages were about our words and about our tongue. And it was my job to go through and write every single verse, handwritten three times in cursive. And I spent the weekend doing that. During that time, spending all that time writing out those verses, I encountered a lot of the passages that we've talked about over the last three weeks. 
Writing down Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. That's what we talked about in week one of this series, that that our words have a power that are not just in and of themselves, but have deeper eternal sources. That from the very beginning, God spoke life into existence, and we, made in God's image, have the ability, therefore, to speak life. And yet in Genesis 3, Satan, through the serpent, spoke death and doubt and division. And so these two kind of eternal frequencies hum in creation and our words are always participating in one of them or the other in life or in death. I wrote down passages, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, words from Jesus, where Jesus said, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. It's what we talked about last week that Jesus wants us to understand that our words are, a, are the fruit and that our heart is at the root. That we don't just have issues with what we say, but those issues really point back to our hearts that the content of our words reveals the condition of our heart. And as I wrote down these words, I saw this consistent warning across both the Old and the New Testament. It's something that we already know experientially, but something that God wants us to hear many times in Scripture. So while this may be simple and straightforward, this is, a, this is a, one of the warnings God has over and over for us. Our words can hurt others. Oh, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's baloney. That's, what it is. That's the Greek word for that is baloney. Our words can absolutely wound other people, hurt other people. In fact, Scripture has visceral imagery for this. Proverbs 12, 18 says, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Like Our, our words... In moments where we, we, we blow our top, where we, where we just react without thinking, where we just start speaking out of whatever, of whatever we're feeling in that moment, our words, they're like swords, they're like knives. We can cut in and carve up people with what we say. But sometimes it's not just that our words are happening and, and we're, we're reckless with it. And we go, oh man, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean that, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. It's also times where we come and we're looking for the fight. Proverbs 16, 28 says, a perverse person stirs up conflict. Oh, uh, There's times where with that grudge we're holding, with that frustration we have, we come ready for our pound of flesh. Or sometimes we won't say it to their face. The other half of the verse says, and a gossip separates close friends. Sometimes it, we won't just say it behind somebody's back, like I, I did with my mom, but not to anybody. No, sometimes we're saying it behind their back, and we're saying it to anybody who will listen. And I've thought about this, this imagery of this dirt. Dirt is where stuff grows. And in a garden, that should be a really good thing. But in the point that my parents were trying to make, I look back and think, oh man, when our words are dirt, they're providing a place for things to grow that we shouldn't be nurturing. Our words sometimes are the kind of dirt that are helping to grow pain in someone else's heart. Our words are the kind of dirt that are hoping, help, helping to, to, to air somebody else's dirty laundry and, and grow division in relationships. Our words are the kind of dirt that are trying to, to tear someone else down in order to try and build ourselves up. And what's growing there is pain. What's growing there is insecurity. What's growing there is division. What's growing there is sin. And since all of us talk every single day, the challenge is it feels like there's, there's, uh, there's all kinds of ways to get it wrong, all kinds of landmines to step on in different conversations. And sometimes, sometimes Proverbs 10, 19 actually has the best game plan, which some of you already, you do this game plan really well, more than some of us who sometimes talk too much. Proverbs 10, 19 says, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Somebody's not a note taker and they're like, I'm writing that one down. I need to remember that Bible verse. But really, there are times where what we need to 
grant someone is, I love this, a friend, I heard use this phrase, the gift of withholding, of knowing what, what shouldn't be said. But it's not just that our words can hurt others. When I started writing all those verses down, I also noticed that there are warnings that our words can hurt our witness. All three weeks of this series, we've looked at something in the book of James. Because uh, James, this early church leader who was the half-brother of Jesus, he has a lot to say about our words. And I want to show you uh, one passage we haven't looked at. It's in, it's in James chapter 1, where he writes and says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. I looked up that verse in a lot of other translations to try and see if I could find a different word, but most of them, the vast majority, end with the word worthless because that's what James meant. What that tells me is that this conversation about the power of our words is about more than whether or not we are kind to one another, although that's important. It's about more than whether or not we are encouraging to each other, although we should be. This conversation is also about our witness to the world. What is our faith worth to others in James's language? So let me just paraphrase for a second what, what I hear from James. If they know we go to church, but then they hear how we curse at work. If they know we go to church, but then they watch us talk bad about everybody around us. If they know we go to church, but we sound like everybody else in the neighborhood, everybody else at school, everybody else at work, James says, then our going to church isn't worth that much in terms of our witness to the world. Because we might show up and praise God, but if we're talking in ungodly ways about some of God's other children, well, it reminds me of a story. One of my, one of my buddies, he, um, he's a pastor over in the Grand Prairie area. He was, he was uh, driving around Midlothian. This is during the, the cold snap that happened right before Christmas last year. His tires got low, like happened to a lot of us. And he, he finds a QT, he gets in line, and he's waiting for about 10 minutes, finally gets up to the front for the free air, and then he, he starts filling up his tires at the QT. As he's doing that, he notices that there's a truck that parks not too far away from him. And he realizes this truck looks like maybe they're trying to cut in line when there's a, there's a line of cars behind him as he's filling up his tires. He gets to his last tire and watches as the, the, the person trying to cut the line gets out of their truck and, and tries to walk up. Well, this is at the same time that the person who's, second, who's next up in the long line gets out and they walk towards each other. And my buddy, Lindsay, is filling up his tires while he watches as these two start talking and then they start yelling and then they start cursing and there's four letter words flying in the QT parking lot and my buddy is sitting there filling up his tire thinking this is crazy it's three days before Christmas and they're fighting over free air <laughs> and they go back and forth and and, and I mean ev every word you could think of is coming out and finally it was either they were going to come to blows or head to their cars and one of them kind of done with everything after throwing a few more in just says God bless you sir and turns to leave <laughs> And at that point, my buddy had had enough. He stood up, went into pastor mode. He goes, gentlemen, it is three days before Christmas and you are cursing out each other over free air. Get back in your trucks. Everybody's going to get the air they need. That's enough. And then he got in his car and drove away. <laughs> he, he said after that, he said, he said, what happened next? I don't know. You might have to ask the Midlothian Police Department. But man, one of those moments that actually is a, is a real life picture of what James says in chapter three. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Now, at this point in the lesson, I, I feel like it's important to help you here. <laughs> that I believe that these warnings from God are spoken in love. The point, some of you are like, man, church, the sermon today is just bummer. 
This is, this is a downer. But what I want you to hear is I believe God communicates these warnings to us as a father in love because he wants us to understand reality. And the reality is our words can hurt others. And the reality is our words can undermine our witness in the world. And at the same time, I want you to understand that the Bible is incredibly even handed not just about warnings concerning our words, but wisdom for how to steward the power of our words. That God has not just what should not be, but then what ought to be. If James has showed us what should not be, the the Apostle Paul gives us a really balanced answer of what ought to be. To help us understand that there is both defense and offense in the game plan for how we steward our words. Ephesians 4.29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. There's the defense. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Let me say again, verses like this are about way more than just policing our language. What I believe God wants in his family and in his church is to cultivate a kingdom culture where we understand the positive impact that our words can have and where we steward them in that direction. Because our words, yes, they can do damage, but our words are meant to build up. That's what our words are meant to do. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what will build others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That our words are intended to build others up and and in such a way that they personally acknowledge, meaning that we're listening, to the needs of others and how we might be able to address, meet, encourage, based on the needs of those people in front of us, that they walk away, away benefiting from a conversation with us. In fact, words then that they can treasure words that spoke life and grace and truth. Which brings me to this second visual of this box. So it's been several weeks ago that I walked into my office and I found this box. I didn't know who had given it to me. I didn't know where it came from. And then I, uh, I opened the box and inside I found a letter. It's from a uh, from a member who's, who's been part of our church for a very long time, served our church in a lot of different ways. His name is Arnold Pitchford. Arnold wrote that, that this box is made of, uh, of wood that was taken from his farm, and he had a carpenter build several of these boxes to give as gifts. And he writes that, that these are what he calls, this is a love box. Arnold has one of these boxes, a a love box, and in it, he keeps notes of remembrance from his kids, from his grandkids, from his wife who has now gone on to be with the Lord. He said it's become a place where he stores up words like treasures. He wrote that one one of his absolute favorite notes that he keeps in his love box is from his wife, Lil, during her battle with cancer. And it's just a short little note that just says, I love you so much. That's his favorite note that he, that he has. And he said, I, I want some people to have one of these so that you can keep and treasure words from people in your life. And he wrote, I know you will treasure the contents far more than the box. Oh, man, I I was blown away by his generosity and kindness. And at the same time, I also thought, this is the picture. This is the picture right here. That you and I have an opportunity through our words to say things that people will treasure. In fact, here's here's some some language from Proverbs that, that paints this picture. Words spoken at the right time are like gold apples in a silver setting. That with the words that we communicate to others, the words we use to build up others, they become treasures that are stored in someone's heart. Our words have that kind of power. And, and, and as an experiment, I asked people online this week, what are some of the most powerful words spoken over you? The most powerful words. 
And there were hundreds of responses. I don't have time to share all of them, but I'll share three kind of categories that broadly came out. The first category were words of wisdom and truth. People answered what were the most powerful words. They wrote things like, test everything you are taught against what Scripture teaches. Somebody wrote that the most powerful words, one of the most powerful words were, you are not responsible for other people's actions or emotions. Somebody said the advice was this, what you set your heart on now, your feet will follow for years to come. And this category of words of truth and wisdom, there are times where we just need people to point us in a direction, to steer us with wisdom based on their own experiences, wisdom based on scripture, truth to understand reality as God defines it. The second category of words was the vast majority of responses. And I would categorize it as words we all long to hear. Words like, I love you. People wrote the most powerful words, I forgive you. I believe in you. You are enough. I am proud of you. Pretty much every single one of those had multiple people who answered this way. That these are the words we long to hear. And, and it's, it's interesting to me that the words we most long to hear don't take long to say. They are short sentences that can have a lifelong impact on someone. So, so let me just pause and ask for a second. Is there someone in your life that this week, today, if you were to say some of those words to them, they would treasure them in their heart for longer than you would know? Is there somebody in your life that if you were to look at them and say, I forgive you, that that could be one of the greatest gifts, a manifestation of God's grace that you speak over them? There's somebody in your life that for you to look at them and say, I am proud of you, would mean so much coming from you. And these, these words, they're treasures that get stored up so much longer than we realize. Some of these people were talking about something that had been said years ago. They've never forgotten them. The third category besides wisdom and truth, besides the words we all long to hear, was a little bit different. They were words spoken at a critical moment in someone's life. And those often weren't just about the words that were, were said. It was about the season that somebody stepped in and spoke life to that person. Somebody wrote that at a crucial moment, the, the most powerful words they had ever heard were, your story isn't over that they had reached this cul-de-sac moment in their life, this dead-end moment where they didn't know what they were going to do. And to hear that, your story isn't over, was breathing life and hope into their heart and soul. For somebody else, it was when they were fired from their job, questioning their worth, and a dear friend made them look them in the eyes and then spoke to their value and worth and dignity as a man, as a husband, as a father. And that was the moment they needed those words. One woman shared about a season of caring for aging parents, one of whom was in a facility, a trying and, and, and exhausting and in some ways thankless season. And somebody looked at them and said, you are a good daughter. And that was, that was what she needed to hear in that moment. Sometimes it's about wisdom and truth. Sometimes it's words all of us long to hear. But sometimes it's about stepping in at just the right moment. And we might not always know if, God will, if we have the words, but to ask God and step in trusting that I can speak life right here because this is a time when somebody needs it. But the thing about these words is that it, it's not just the words that are spoken. But a lot of people testified it was the voice that was speaking it. Because for a lot of us, 
And maybe some other people have said those things to us, but there is somebody in our life that we have longed would say those things to us. And what I want each one of us to realize is that we steward that same influence and power in somebody else's life. So let me just pause for a second. Husband, your words, when spoken thoughtlessly, can stab into the side of your bride like a sword. But your words, when spoken in affirming love, become treasures in her heart for the rest of her days. Wife, your words can absolutely cut down your husband's sense of confidence. But your words have the power to build him up that he stores inside more than you know. Parent, mother, father, your words It is hard to overstate the power with which you can speak life into your children. And they may not always show that they're receiving it that way, but it becomes treasure stored in their heart that carries into their adulthood for the rest of their days. Son or daughter, I don't know what your relationship is with your parents, but you need to know your words to turn back around and say, I'm so grateful to God for you, mom or dad. To say, I'm I'm so thankful for the ways that you've loved me. I see the ways that you've served. When you say those things, you do not know what it can mean. I mean, you might know because they might just cry as soon as you say it. But you have a power. And this is true for you as a sibling, as a brother or sister. This is true for you as a friend. This is true for you as a coworker. God has given every single one of us the ability to steward our words. And the question is, when we look at what we're saying to the people around us, to the people we spend the most time with, to the people that are closest to us, where would our words belong right now? Are we saying things that are providing a place for things to grow in our life and in someone else's heart and in our relationships that we do not want to nurture? Or are we saying things that people could take away and store in their heart for the rest of their days? Because God has given each one of us that ability. And God has modeled it for us in love and grace. Author Philip Yancey, he writes about a survey of the words people most want to hear. And there were different phrases ranked. The number one spot won't surprise you. Number one spot was, I love you. The number two spot for the words we most want to hear are, I forgive you. But the third spot surprised him. Number three on the list of words we most want to hear are, supper's ready. And Yancey pointed out that those three words inadvertently tell a little picture, tell a little story of the gospel. That God, the words God has spoken over us is, I love you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In the midst of our failure, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our sin and rejection from God, God spoke love over us. And Jesus came to earth And and through his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus not only did something that that would have the last word over Satan and over his accusations against us, but Jesus also spoke a word of forgiveness and grace to say, I forgive you. On the cross, even as he was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And then Jesus sets the table for us. In fact, every week as a church, we take communion and it's an opportunity to hear a divine word of, hey, supper is still ready. The body broken, the blood poured out. We remember that, but there is an eternal banquet coming. 
A promise from Jesus, who when he ascended to the right hand of God, he promised that he would come back and gather all of God's family, all of God's children, all of God's kingdom, and we would be at a wedding banquet, that we'd be at a table, and the spirit and the bride in Revelation say, come, a supper is ready. There's an eternal feast waiting for us because God, oh, he has spoken the better word. In fact, Hebrews says that Jesus' blood speaks a better word over us. And so when we speak life, we, we speak aligned with what God has said, what God continues to say, and what God promises will be the echo of eternity. So for you and I, each week in this series, we've had a, a, a practice, a simple way to apply this. And this week, I want to invite you to take this practice, to speak life by blessing others. Now, I, I chose that word intentionally because God, after he created the world, after he spoke life into existence, he blessed it. He called it good. And then throughout the Bible, there's this echo of blessing. It happens in the Old Testament, a lot of different places. It happens in Jesus's ministry. That he, he blesses the crowd at the Sermon on the Mount through the Beatitudes as he begins his sermon with blessing. When he would, he would encounter children, he would lay his hands on them. This is multiple places in the gospel and he would bless them. At the end of his ministry, after he has died for the sins of the world, been resurrected to defeat evil and, and the grave, and then when he's about to ascend, he gathers with his disciples in Luke 24. He lifts his hands and then he begins to bless them. And as he's blessing them, he ascends into heaven. It's as if all throughout Jesus' ministry, there is blessing going on, echoing what God continues to say, the better word over us. And so for you and I, we as followers of Jesus, we are one with Christ. We get to continue that, that blessing now, a blessing is more than an encouragement, although a blessing often encourages. A blessing is more than a comforting word, although a blessing often brings comfort. So what is a blessing? A blessing is not a, a, a spiritual incantation. It's not a, it's not a magic collection of words. But a blessing is a moment where we speak drawing from words that are in the treasure trove of God's heart for someone in front of us. So one of, the, one of the clearest examples of this is actually when God instructs Moses, here's what I want my priests to say. He says, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. See, blessing is when I am aligned with God's heart for someone in front of me. When I'm gonna bless somebody, I'm not speaking out of my own resources and I am not talking in my own authority. I am speaking with the authority God has given every single one of us because the New Testament We'll actually see this in this first Peter series. We are called a royal priesthood. That means it's not just a, a preacher's job to bless. We're all part of the royal priesthood. In Revelation, we're, we're a kingdom of priests. And so you and I have this same, not just ability, but responsibility as representing the heart of God to someone else. So when you bless you're saying what God wants spoken over that person. And somebody hears that and goes, okay, Taylor, how do you know that you're doing that? Two, two guardrails. The first is being attentive and listening for the spirit. And the second is, is what you're saying aligned with or in any way contradicting what God has already spoken and inspired through the spirit and his word. And in that moment, you're able to say, something, and, and 
in Numbers, it talks about putting, putting, God wants to put his name on somebody, on somebody in his kingdom. And so the way that I've been practicing this is blessing people in the name of Jesus. That may sound maybe a, a, little, a little mainline, a little Catholic, a little different. But for me, it's been an exercise in realizing this is not something I do in my own resources. But it's a moment where I align with God's heart for somebody in front of me and I listen and try to speak something that I know God wants to give. What do they need that I know God wants to give? And so to finish, I'd, I was praying for our church, praying and asking God, what, what does our church need that you have already said you want to give? And God led me to this place in John chapter 20, after, after the resurrection, Jesus blessed his disciples with peace. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And so, Hills Church, in the name of Jesus, I bless you to know more of God's love and his purposes for your life. In the name of your Savior, who wants to give you peace, I bless you with peace from the Holy Spirit. I bless you with humility so that when we get it wrong, we can repent and turn around and say, God, teach me again how to use my words. But I bless you with courage to speak not out of your own authority, but in the authority of your Savior who sits enthroned over every power, over every people, over every age. And I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow together. God, I thank you for the better word that you have spoken through the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you for a resurrected Savior who blesses his people, blesses his disciples. We receive your blessing today, Lord. And I pray for anybody listening who has yet to have that better word spoken over them who has yet to receive and say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So each day, Lord, teach us. Teach us how to build others up. Teach us how to bless. And may we speak from the overflow of the love you've poured into our hearts. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.